Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Design and Medical Devices Conference 2020 special session on the COVID-19 innovations at the University of Minnesota. My name is Will Durfee. I'm one of the conference organizers, and we're glad to have you all here. We've got six speakers this morning. Each one will present uh, about a 10 minutes on uh, what they've been involved in. There'll be a chance to ask a few questions at the end of each speaker, so you can use uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to post a question, and then I'll read them off uh, for the presenters, and we'll do a couple of questions after each uh, presentation. And then there'll be time at the end to do uh, more questions to any one of the presenters. So to kick us off, the first presenter is John Bischoff. John is the director of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine at the University of Minnesota and a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. John, take it away. Thank you, Will. One moment. So uh, I hope everybody can see my screen all right. Um, it's my pleasure to talk uh, to you today about our COVID response at the Institute for Engineering and Medicine. Uh, Will is actually a part of IEM. He has been running our clinical engagement program with Brad Benson and Paul Izio, and much of what you're gonna hear from me comes directly out of his engagement and leadership of this uh, program within IEM. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all and also invite you to see some of the things you're gonna hear about today. Also on our website, we have a COVID response, uh, not just web page, but multiple web pages that highlight some of the really outstanding work that you're gonna hear about today. Uh, this all really started in March, as many of you know. And David Odie, who's Associate Director of the Institute, reached out and had a phone call where industry as well as academics from across the university and across the Twin Cities got together to talk about how we could together look for engineering solutions <coughs> for these healthcare needs. And that's what this session and what Will has been leading uh, is all about. And so as one uh, aspect of this, IM has pledged about a quarter of a million dollars to rapid grants, which you can see on our website. And many of the people who are speaking this morning have received uh, some of these grants. And we are actually doing this in collaboration with our Clinical and Translational Science Institute and the Minnesota Robotics Institute. Uh, it's clearly a collaboration that's going across the medical school and uh, the College of Science and Engineering. So uh, some of these rapid grants, and I'm not going to read out in detail all of them, but uh, you know, uh, James Dutton is in the Stem Cell uh, uh, Institute, uh, Mark Osborne is in pediatrics working on diagnostics, uh, uh, Ricardo is in uh, rehabilitation uh, medicine, Natasha Wright uh, in mechanical engineering, Hugh Lim, Hubert Lim in BME, and Will Pomerantz in chemistry, all of them uh, coming together with different aspects of diagnostics, uh, PPE, medical devices, and uh, uh, also therapeutics for COVID. Uh, we've also, we're going to hear today from Chris about uh, some uh, of his work in aerosol management in the age of COVID, and uh, Will has helped to lead uh, a mask program. You're going to hear from Lindsay Griffin about that a bit later. Uh, Jenping Wang also is working in the diagnostic space. So uh, what we have really done, and, and again, Will has been really leading this, is We've been able to reach out across the university and engage the resources, the considerable resources of a tier one research institution, both in engineering and in the medical school to address needs. And these needs have been uh, really, um, they're coming directly from the clinician. And I, I find this so encouraging as an engineer because many times we as engineers, you know, we do what we do, we have our tools, we understand how to do engineering solutions and designs, but sometimes we try to push them out to the clinical environment. And, it, and this program here is really about clinicians reaching out to us 
So it's not, a, it's not a push, it's a pull. In each one of these cases, specific clinicians have reached out through IAM, through Will and others to actually engage with organically groups of engineers and uh, biomedical scientists, physical scientists, and uh, clinicians across the university to help. And what you see here are things that, because of supply chain issues, were not addressed from the highest level of leadership during the COVID crisis. And so we had problems with ventilators, hospital gowns, aerosol booths and management, protective masks, uh, ECMO, 3D printed parts to re repurpose ventilators, uh, UV uh, sanitizing robots for some of the sterilization and sanitizing needs. All of these were organic projects, some of which you're gonna hear about in this exciting lineup that Will has for you today. And so I'm not going to spend much time talking about each one of them because you're gonna hear from the very inventors themselves in a few minutes. But I just wanna highlight again, uh, really it's, it's been a privilege for the Institute for Engineering and Medicine to act as an umbrella organization to help <coughs> bring people together to address these needs. Uh, we, um, you know, this really, as I said, started with a phone call in March and now here we are in June, and even before June, we had open source licenses for many of these solutions to the supply chain needs that you're gonna hear about. And the co-venture is really uh, very the, the first and really uh, one of the you know, shining examples of a uh, collaborative uh, effort between Steve Richardson, who is uh, going into a faculty position in the Department of Anesthesiology, along with Art Erdman and Steve Tamala in the Medical Device Center, which of course is part of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine. And they're actually collaborating with Boston Scientific and you'll hear much more about it. Very exciting story. Another wonderful story that you're gonna hear about has to do with masks. Uh, everyone has heard about the supply chain issues with N95s. And you know, many people did not know, but there really are hundreds and hundreds of these that are used within the healthcare uh, uh, at the M Health Fairview uh, group alone every day here in Minnesota. And so what we were able to do is, uh, again, with Will's leadership and others, Rhonda Franklin, Mark Hillmeyer, uh, as well as clinicians, Kumar Balani, Rumi Pfizer, and uh, Susan Arnold, an industrial hygienist, and Joni, uh, who's a biomechanician, is really bringing together all these different groups uh, with many different facets to bring to bear uh, to address this need. And I'm not going to steal any of Lindsay's thunder. She's going to tell you all about this. But again, this has led to an open source license, which is up on uh, our website. And anybody in the world now can download this and benefit from this excellent work. Uh, Chris Hogan has worked with uh, uh, Dr. Fu, who was actually, I believe, a resident at the time. And then this is uh, kind of broadened out with Brad Benson into both aerosol booths and aerosol um, um, uh, hoods, which can be used uh, in the uh, clinical environment. And also these booths can be done outside so people can actually walk up and, and do diagnostic testing. Uh, this was a great need that Brad Benson had. Uh, and uh, Chris stepped up to the challenge along with his team and they've just done a phenomenal job. Again, an open source license is there for anybody who wants to now make this all over the world. Another excellent example. Uh, Steve Solitterman, you're going to hear about as well. Uh, uh, he actually was able to step up with his students and actually address the, the issue of not having enough uh, hospital gowns. Uh, and, and again, with uh, Joyce Warr and others, he's been able to develop a very simple, cheap solution. Uh, they call it a gown for you, and I believe we're also going to hear this, uh, this excellent story a little bit later. And it, again, this has led to an open source license. So really powerful stories, and not just stories, but impact beyond the University of Minnesota and within the University of Minnesota and the state. So the session today, uh, as I understand it, you're going, and not necessarily in this order, but you're gonna hear about masks. Uh, you'll hear about the taco box, which also has to do with masks. And then we're gonna hear about the aerosol containment from Chris Hogan, the gown story, and then also about the co-venture from Aaron Tucker. And uh, I just wanna say again, uh, it's a privilege uh, to be able to act in a facilitating and supportive role 
as an institute, as an umbrella organization to help foster this phenomenal leadership uh, that you see and you're gonna hear about uh, during this session. So thank you, Will, for the invitation and thank you all of the panelists and uh, all of you for attending. That was great. Thank you very much, John. That was a terrific overview to the uh, session and the exciting topics we are uh, about to hear from. And thanks to the Institute for Engineering and Medicine for supporting many of these projects. All right, next up we have Lindsay Griffin. Lindsay is an assistant professor of wearable product design in the Department of Design, Housing and Apparel in the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. So Lindsay, thanks for being here and take it away. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, let me bring up my presentation real quick. Hmm. Oops, here we go. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to be presenting on um, the MinMath project, um, which is a partnership between the Institute of Engineering and Medicine, uh, CSE, CDES, um, and many others. Um, so I'm first gonna give you kind of a background of the project, and then we'll go into the designs that we've developed um, to meet the need. So <clears throat> what matters in a mask? Uh, there are many different types of masks out on the market right now. Um, they range from the cloth masks that um, the home sewers and uh, community members have been making to surgical masks to um, N95 masks, which is uh, the main focus of um, this project. Um, and within every mask, uh, there are some main components. Those are filtration, um, breathing resistance, so you don't want the material to be too hard to breathe through. Um, comfort, it must be skin friendly, um, it must fit the wearer, and uh, the materials have to be available to make these masks. Um, so there are many different types of masks, as I just uh, talked about, um, ranging from the homemade mask to self-contained breathing apparatuses. Um, so the, the main focus uh, of the projects that we, that we have worked on is really the filtration, finding an adequate material to meet the need of um, a higher uh, filtration to be able to filter out the COVID-19 virus. Um, and then the fit of the mask. So as you can see from the images at the above, above the screen, um, uh, the, the closer the fit of the mask, the stronger the seal, the more you will be able to filter out of your, um, filter out of the mask. Um, and that is, comes into play in terms of how you're defining what level of protection your mask is going to provide to the wearer. So the problem that we started with, we all know like the the news was endless in terms of what this N95 shortage was causing. Um, the New York Times headlines, Washington Post headlines, uh, there was a severe shortage of protective gear and it was really dire. Um, and the reason of this is, you know, the prior to the pandemic, um, you know, we have, when the pandemic started in China, the supply chain started to break. Um, currently, about or prior to the pandemic, about 50% of the world's mask supply came directly from China. Um, so when that supply chain broke, that meant that a lot of other countries in need were not getting the adequate mask supply. Um, and then, secondly, there was a there was a real um, shortage of important components to these masks. So there was a material shortage, there's an elastic shortage um, beyond just the shortage of the mask. 
So it wasn't easy just to uh, ha say 3M, make, the, make more masks. You know, there's a big supply chain that uh, 3M and other industry leaders had to work through in order to um, build supply up. So in mid-March, uh, we, as I said, we were in a dire situation. So um, the IEM converged uh, experts from across campus to address the shortage. We developed a problem statement for how we were going to approach the mask N95 shortage. Um, by March 21st, we had our first prototypes developed. Um, and then by March 26th, we had partnered with Cummins Filtration. They sent us media, we tested it, and we tested the mask design all in one day. It was a furious effort to be able to um, uh, get all of the experts and uh, industry partners aligned in order to address the problem. So the design status, mid-March, uh, we were, you know, like it was very, um, rudimentary what we have today we have three strong designs that we have developed um, and we have actually produced so today i'm going to talk to you a little bit about those designs um, first uh, filter media per media performance that was kind of the key um, piece to the puzzle when we first started um, we needed to find a um, material that filtered in the same capacity and at the same level as other N95 masks without that filter performance. That meant that we, if we didn't have the filter performance, we wouldn't be able to succeed in the project as we have. So um, we tested it and it does perform above the N95 level. You see in the black um, here, so you see this black line is the 3M um, comparison, and these two lines are two versions of the Cummins media. So it's not quite as good as 3M, but it's still above the efficiency level um, for N95 masks. Um, so an overview of the mask styles. We have three styles. Um, style one is a, a mask. It features heat sealed contour around the face. It um, foam for comfort and fit, and then you can have a versatile band placement for a complete seal. Style two is a filter accessory for a reusable mask, and style three is a general purpose mask. Um, and I'll talk about those each individually. But first, when we approached this design problem, we were really focused on um, how can we build masks at high volume? How can we, um, how can we uh, use non-endangered supply chains, so not using elastic, finding a, an alternative to the filter material? And finally, how can we make these masks without a costly manufacturing process and using um, you know, essentially unskilled labor to create these masks? So that was kind of like what we started um, with when we approach the design problem. And today we've done qualitative and quali quantitative testing of all three styles. Um, and we have built um, many, many masks um, uh, for, for this project. So first, uh, this is a, an example of what that manufacturing process looks like. So for style one, for instance, we start with a flat sheet of the filter media, a rectangular sheet. Um, a lot of N95 masks and more advanced masks are molded or they have curved pieces for contour around the face. We knew that um, we needed a really um, basic shape in order to start with. Um, so we started with a plain rectangle. We used um, commercial heat sealers used a lot in food, uh, food supplies, uh, plastic, um, they heat plastic bags. Um, and then we used uh, um, foam to help um, uh, create that seal across a wide variety of faces. So this is the single use close fitting mask. Um, and these are the materials and tools that are used to make that. Um, we had to get really creative with the tool, with the materials. We used weather seal foam, closed cell foam, duct tape, um, and uh, um, uh, 
coffee filter bendable components in order to create the mask and then readily available tools as well. Um, so here is some of the fit testing that we've done. So these are fit testing comparing the U of M prototype to um, some disposable N95. So as you can see, we are right in line with, with what is on the market. Um, uh, the goal with these numbers here is for the for it to be qualified as an N95, it must be over 100. Um, and we did many qualitative fit tests uh, out of my garage and uh, out um, and at M Health Fairview with physicians and uh, other healthcare professionals. Um, and then once we were able to narrow in on a design, we decided to go ahead and um, create a socially distanced U of M campus factory uh, um, at McNeil Hall on St. Paul campus. Um, so this is, uh, we, we had to get really creative with the rooms and with the flow of product in order to keep socially distanced um, and, to, and really build in a lot of, um, protocols for sanitation and to make sure that all everyone that came to campus was um, was healthy and stayed healthy throughout the process. We used um, undergraduate and graduate students to help build these. Um, we worked up to production of about 500 masks per day. So over a 10 day period, we built a crisis stockpile of 5,000 masks for use by M Health Fairview. Um, and these again are, are are a stockpile. So if we ever get into a situation where supply is down to zero, um, M Health Fairview is um, is prepared for that. So the second style was an anesthesia mask accessory. So this was um, first kind of introduced by Boston's Children's Hospital, um, and Dr. Rumi Fraser um, introduced it to us. Um, we went through some brainstorming. There's an image of Will uh, with the Pinocchio uh, uh, design idea. Um, and then Mark Hillmeyer, who's uh, um, faculty in chemistry, um, uh, came up with this this prototype in conjunction with the team. Um, and we are building 700, uh, I think we're increasing that to 2000 of those um, to be uh, also used as a crisis supply. And these are kind of used for those, fitting faces is really difficult, getting a complete seal is difficult. So this design is used for those that cannot fit into style one. And finally, Helen, so you we are finish creating, up in about a minute. You got it. We're creating, um, uh, um, 50,000 masks for use by U of M minutes, uh, U of M units. Um, and this one, all you need is a rubber band, the filter media, a stapler and a bendable component, and you can make it. So it's a really simple, um, simple way to have a lot of filter, um, a good filter quality masks. We have uh, created open source um, documents and they are currently released through the Office of Textile Technology Commercialization. Um, the supply status in Minnesota has gotten a lot better. We've de uh, they've developed a lot of re um, decontamination, um, but there's still a need for N95s and respirators in other industries as people go get back to work. Um, so, we have a lot of work planned, um, mainly material testing and fit testing um, in the future. And then um, we really believe that this method by um, we're able to protect local workers in the short term and in the long term, we have this design knowledge and, and re instruction repository um, that can be used in future emergency or pandemic. And thank you. Any questions? Uh, that, that's great, Lindsay. Thanks, thanks so much. That's a terrific overview of the MinMask project. And I'm sure all 73 people listening want to get their own MinMask. Um, so again, a reminding uh, everyone, if you've got a question, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom to um, type your question. Uh, don't see any at this point. Point, but there will be time at the end to, to ask your question. Okay, so next up we've got uh, Asan Naderi. 
Desan's an assistant professor of product design in the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. Um, he's going to be talking to you about a project where it, it might seem, it, it's, it's a wonderful project because it's a great example of good design process that listens to the customer, listens to the need, and develops um, a really remarkable um, solution that has had tremendous impact in the M Health Fairview system. So for those of you out there who are interested in design process, this one can be a model for you. So uh, Azan, take it away. Hello, good morning. Uh, well, let me go back to the first slide. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay, sounds great. Good morning. Uh, I'm Hassan Naderi, Assistant Professor of Product Design at the U. Uh, one of the problems that was introduced by the medical school to uh, College of Science and Engineering and College of Design was uh, a solution, a good solution for use and extended use of the N95 masks. And we designed uh, a storage box, which is also called the taco box because of the visual similarity to taco box, uh, to address this issue. Uh, the M Health uh, Fairview had some problems with storing uh, the N95 masks based on 152 protocol. The shortage of the N95 masks uh, pushed the, the healthcare uh, facilities to reuse and uh, to reuse the N95 max masks and also to use them for a longer period of the time. But they had the issue with the storing them in a place. And on the right side, you can see uh, the how uh, they could store uh, the N95 masks in uh, in the paper bags. Uh, the safe and clean the storage of the masks, uh, they need to write and find the shift states and rotations. Uh, everything was hard to track. Uh, the paper bags were hard to find in the messy environment and it uh, creates an unpleasant experience uh, for visitors and the healthcare workers. We formed an interdisciplinary team. Again, College of Science and Engineering, Medical School, and College of Design, we met on Zoom and we discussed the issues and we also discussed the potential solutions to address this problem. Um, now I want to talk about the process. Uh, we, uh, we started with uh, product specification and requirement gathering. Uh, we reviewed some of the protocols and recommendations from the CDC, how to store the mask and how uh, we keep them safe and clean for reuse and extended use. We also listened to the frontline healthcare workers. Uh, and also we did some measurements of the mask and also environments. Uh, we start with the ideation on the paper. Uh, we start to sketch on the piece of paper and uh, see how we can provide a good sustainable solution to address this problem. And then we started to create very simple, basic uh, sketch models with basic tools that we had. Uh, we had, we also, we all have access to them. Then uh, we started the development of uh, the, we started to develop the, the, the solution based on the issues that we identified in the sketch models. Uh, we refined the ideas, we tried to incorporate some of the detailed uh, information that we acquired through the testing and then uh, we started to think about design for manufacturing and design for assembly. That was a big challenge 
because during the, the time of production, we had very limited access to the makerspace facilities at U of M. Basically, we couldn't uh, reach out to or outsource the production because of, uh, because of the uh, shelter, uh, shelter order. Uh, so we and, we, and we encountered issues with the production because we had to deal with the limitations of the tools that we have in terms of size, in terms of the capacity, and also the, the limited materials and also the material aspects that we already had in stock. Uh, we also needed to think about the easy assembly uh, without any instruction or without any particular uh, tool for the assembly. So we deliberately designed something simple to, to be able to produce that at Anderson's lab and also um, at the College of Design Fabrication Lab. And uh, the, the design was assembled, uh, were assembled with uh, some of the volunteers and also the staff at the College of Design and College of Science and Engineering. Um, after that, we did some testing. After the final production, we did some testing uh, at home and also we created some prototype for testing in the context. This video shows how some of the tests, we ran some of the basic tests to see if the, the idea works fine. One of the features was stacking or uh, secure stacking of uh, secure stacking of the, the storage boxes. Uh, because again, we wanted to create an organized space in the healthcare environments. So we ran some testing uh, and also we asked the healthcare workers to provide some feedback after using the initial prototypes. Uh, eventually we were able to create and produce uh, I think something about 600, 700 uh, taco boxes uh, for the healthcare workers. This is the final design. As you can see, there are some uh, very unique features to that. And this solution is available. Uh, I think very soon it should be the, the open. It has been licensed for open source use and it should be available very soon on UMM website. Um, well, we created an organized, safe, and clean storage for using the N95 mask. Also, uh, with the labels, uh, with the angled labels, uh, healthcare workers can dry their shift, and they are easy to read shifts and rotation, they are very easy to read and uh, easy to track. So they are not confused with, uh, they couldn't get confused with uh, the shifts and rotations. And so they can uh, accurately locate the mask and use that for the next time. We also uh, talked about the proper ventilation while preventing uh, from the contamination. So we designed some uh, vents on the side and uh, on the bottom of the mask to make sure that nothing from the top goes in, into, the, into the box and contaminate the face masks. Uh, also proper stacking, the, uh, it provides enough and proper ventilation from the underneath of the box and also it enables the, the, the boxes to be stacked on top of each other uh, with minor wobbling or uh, falling. Uh. And we believe that this is also a sustainable solution. These are some of the images uh, from, the, uh, from the hospital when the healthcare worker used the taco boxes at the hospital. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, uh, the environment is much more organized and uh, it creates a safe and uh, clean
clean solution for the healthcare workers. Uh, we also use the uh, uh, corrugated cardboard material to make sure that we develop a sustainable solution. Okay, thank you. That was great, thanks, Isan. And at, um, I think we heard from the people at M Health Fairview that this system that you and your team has developed has made a, a real difference uh, in the M Health Fairview uh, system. And we know that there's other medical centers that are interested in picking up on this. All right, so uh, next up is Chris Hogan. Chris is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and he's going to be talking about um, how you can keep um, uh, patients and healthcare providers separated through the science of aerosols. Take it away, Chris. Uh, thanks. So, um, I need uh, I need the previous person to stop sharing. Hey, Asan, if you could stop your screen share, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a, a collaboration that I, I have to uh, say was really initiated by uh, members of our medical, uh, Hateen Fu and uh, Kumar Balani, who you can see here. Um, and wouldn't have been possible without the, the efforts of our College of Science and Engineering machine shop, in particular, Ron Bystrom and, and Peter Ness, who, who aren't pictured here. Um, and these are efforts to, to really prevent um, a transmission of COVID-19 uh, nosocomially, meaning in the hospital, and uh, primarily to, to healthcare workers. Uh, so to motivate this, um, I wanna show um, a note from the Center uh, for Disease Control um, on their hierarchy of controls. Uh, and this isn't specific to healthcare workers, but just specific to, 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 to risks in the workplace. Um, and so you can imagine anything, uh, most likely a chemical, um, which could be hazardous to your health if it's on your skin or you inhale it, uh, and there's a risk of it being volatile or uh, being in an aerosol or a droplet. Now, uh, in that case, if you look at their hierarchy of controls, what you can see is that PPE is, should really be regarded as a, as a last resort. And in most industries, that is the case. Uh, where work is done to minimize risk is in terms of engineering controls as well as administrative controls, such that you are, you are um, uh, free from the risk. Now, uh, when dealing with patients, this is a lot more difficult. Of course, we can't eliminate or substitute um, what, the, what the patient has, but we can be uh, working on engineering controls uh, to supplement PPE. Um, as you can see, the, the amount of PPE that, that, that health providers are wearing is a lot, face shields, masks, gowns, and gloves. Some are doubling up on masks. Um, and and uh, we, we need to be able to provide different forms of protection, uh, which are just beyond PPE. Uh, there are very specific reasons for, for doing that, for, for aerosol and droplet risks. That is transmission, which occurs either by um, a, a respiratory secretion in the form of a large droplet that is ejected through a cough and a sneeze. And there's concern over um, uh, smaller particles and droplets, which are released possibly during uh, speech or, or heavy breathing. Um, there's also risk during what are called aerosol generating procedures. Um, an aerosol generating procedure is a qualitative term uh, in healthcare, uh, but includes things that are very common for COVID-19 patients. There was an article in the Washington Post by an anesthesiologist uh, describing intubation when they open up the airway, how close they need to get to the patient and the risk associated with it. And this is essential uh, in order to provide ventilation. Um, in addition to, to intubation, uh, for, for invasive ventilation, there are a number of uh, aerosol generating procedures which could be beneficial to COVID patients, but aren't necessarily used right now. Uh, these include things like CPAP and BiPAP, which are positive pressure ventilation, uh, not uh, with an endotracheal tube, but, but with a mask over the patient. Uh, these aren't used right now out of fear that this is uh, introducing viral aerosol into the air as well as high flow nasal cannula. Uh, there's evidence that these are, are very positive treatments for, for COVID-19 patients and should be used. Uh, in addition, they're also used to supplement ventilation. So in general, we don't go from a person's natural breathing all the way up to, to invasive ventilation if possible. Uh, they like to step things up from high flow nasal cannula to non-invasive ventilation to invasive ventilation and then step things back if possible. And we're losing these intermediate steps if we don't provide um, uh, some degree of protection to healthcare providers from, from aerosol risks. Uh, 
So uh, to do that, uh, prior to the start of our project, there were uh, intubation boxes developed. They came uh, from a design out of Taiwan that you can see here. Uh, this is really just a physical barrier or a splash guard, if you will. Uh, you can think of it as a face shield that's, that's closer to the patient. Uh, what we've done over the past few weeks is adapt that into a negative pressure hood uh, where the patient's head can go in here. There's HEPA filtration, which um, is, is really much more efficient than you can get from a mask going to a high-speed blower, such that provided the patient's upper airways are, are enclosed uh, within, uh, within the hood, uh, you have healthcare provider access on, on multiple sides. Uh, while, while if the person coughs, breathes, uh, uh, speaks, and there's any sort of infectious droplet introduced, it gets collected by the hood. Uh, so I'll show you some data from, from version one that we've developed. And then I'll also note, here's version two, which is much more portable. Uh, this is being tried out at the um, uh, emergency department of Regions Hospital right now, uh, really where you would have undiagnosed patients and you need something smaller and, and portable um, that you can move. The HEPA filter has been moved off to the side and is a bit smaller here. So um, how do these work? Well, we have a very high flow rate. Um, it is uh, in, it's in excess of 10,000 liters per minute that we're, we're pulling up uh, through a blower. Uh, this is a smoke candle. Um, if I was to ignite that in my laboratory without any form of protection, I would, I would very quickly set off all the smoke detectors. So I could be confident to do this experiment. And uh, with my, my cell phone camera there, I'm looking at a part of the detector in the room to try and the concentration doesn't go up over time. 10 to the four particles per cubic centimeter is pretty standard in a room. Uh, and meanwhile, this, this smoke candle is, is ongoing the whole time and you don't see any smoke penetration uh, through the device. Uh, healthcare providers um, are able to, to intubate on the device. This is Haitin Fu, Kumar Balani, and Ashish Abraham from the M Health System, uh, working on a SimMan patient simulator uh, inside the hood. Uh, actually, while uh, we are spraying an aerosol through the, the, the patient's mouth, and we, we look at fluorescein deposition on PPE in this case. And on the right, you can see a patient demonstrating uh, receiving high flow nasal cannula. Uh, this is, of course, an unsedated, healthy volunteer who, who gave us consent to do this. This is not actual patient. Um, we can be quantitative about describing the performance uh, of these devices using aerosol measurement equipment, which allows us to get the size distribution of particles inside the hood relative to the size distribution outside. We can do this in a, a size regime similar to, to the size of viruses, as well as possibly larger carrier particles and droplets, so over multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, and when we do that, we can quantify what we call the penetration now, this is the concentration measured outside at different locations uh, in the hood relative to the concentration inside when we introduce an aerosol. And we can look at this without any negative pressure blower uh, with half power and full power. Uh, penetration is, is the inverse of collection efficiency. Um, uh, it, it, we tend to look at it for very efficient filters. So an N95, uh, to be honest, it would have a, a 0 0.05 penetration. So all the way up here. So um, when we have our blower on, we are, we are vastly better uh, than an N95 already. So uh, when you take into account um, uh, this device as well as, as N95 respirators, we have a nice force multiplier uh, in terms of our system performance. Um, we can also be quantitative looking at the deposition of particles that we introduce onto PPE um, of a healthcare provider. So uh, Kumar Balani, an anesthesiologist, uh, was our, our, our model for this, and he was performing mock intubation on a SimMan patient simulator where we introduced a fluorine aerosol. Uh, this is the UV light, where we're actually trying to see the, the aerosol. It's, it's not too visible in this case. Um, uh, we are trying to uh, see the aerosol as it's introduced. Uh, we can look at the fluorescein concentration on um, uh, samples that we put on the PPE, both inside and outside the hood. Um, in the absence of negative pressure, uh, we see uh, larger amounts of fluorescein, which would be larger amounts of aerosol, which have deposited on uh, uh, the healthcare provider's PPE, both inside and outside the hood. It does get reduced inside the hood as well because of the residence time of the particles. With, without any driving flow, they just kind of entrain in the air and deposit. But with flow, they're driven up actively and have a very, very short lifetime. Now you'll notice without the hood, uh, there is lower deposition, but the reason for that is it's dispersing throughout the room. So the risk isn't just to the healthcare provider, uh, which is close by, but the risk is to everyone who would actually be in that room, whether it's negative pressure or not. So um, these devices, we have one at the Bethesda Hospital right now, which is where in the M Health system, COVID-19 patients are. 
Um, uh, the, the nursing staff has been trained on its use for uh, uh, compassion extubation. And then the emergency department at Regions is, is, is training uh, and doing simulations uh, with a second more portable device designed for, for patients who aren't diagnosed but, but uh, potentially came into the emergency room for other reasons. Uh, while we were building this, uh, Brad Benson uh, in the hospital approached us about the idea of um, not making negative pressure units, but possibly positive pressure testing booths. Uh, and so the machine shop, as well as Richard and Mechanical Engineering Shipping, um, really took this upon uh, uh, themselves to, to design a positive pressure, so same technology, but with a HEPA filter on the outside and flow pushing in booth. Uh, that can be used for testing patients. Uh, and the key here is that this uh, reduced the need uh, to change gowns and to change PPE every time. So previously to do 100 tests per day would require 100 gowns, 100 masks, and 100 pair of gloves. Now it's two per shift. You have two healthcare providers working in tandem. Uh, the 12th, uh, I, I have to correct this, there are, there are 11 in use. The 12th one was, was just instituted in the Fairview Health System. Um, I hope none of you have had to have a, a COVID test. If you have, there is a possibility within the M Health Fairview system, if you're, if you're local, that you have uh, used these. Um, I can confess I have been tested because of my close proximity to healthcare workers uh, during this. So I actually have been at this booth. Um, I, so I can tell you what happens. The, the patient will uh, grab the, the bars right here. The test was negative, by the way. Um, and uh, the, a nasal swab is done by this healthcare provider. A nasal swab is not the most pleasant experience, but, but you do want to get the right answer. Um, after you walk away, the second healthcare provider comes in, grabs the tests, and cleans off the front. Uh, in that way, there's a barrier between you and the healthcare provider the whole time, uh, and then the one who's cleaning you, you're always socially distanced from. Uh, so, so that's where we are in, in trying to contain um, uh, uh, aerosols and droplets, which could potentially be infectious, but without the need for, for PPE. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. That was really a terrific uh, story, and it's just wonderful to see these devices in use um, um, uh, in the M Health Fairview system and um, really having clinical utility. Okay, next up we've got uh, Steve Slutterman. Steve is with the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and Steve is going to tell you the uh, really uh, fascinating story of how to handle a shortage of gowns. Take it away, Steve. Okay, is the, uh, is the screen showing? Can you see? Yes, it is, and we can uh, uh, see the screen, and we can hear you just fine. Very good. Well, thank you very much for um, attending this conference and this session, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about what my biomedical engineering students have done. So we uh, heard, um, we were informed um, on a Friday, April 17th, that there was going to be a dire shortage of gowns at the M Health Fairview hospitals and clinics. <clears throat> and the story I wanna tell you about is a very exciting two weeks in April. We wanted to try and solve this problem first by locating a source of gowns, either in the United States or internationally, and were unsuccessful. They just could not be found. And so the students uh, got together, they started with a Zoom session, and realized that the best approach to this was to come up with a simple design that could be sourced with materials made locally and assembled locally. And the desire for 10 to 15,000 gowns a day seemed very daunting. Um, and the total request of 350,000 gowns nearly impossible, but the students set about to accomplish that. And this is the team as they got together and met several times, uh, initially twice a day and then once a day, going through uh, their uh, steps to solve this dilemma. This happens to be a Zoom photo that was taken when the uh, Star Tribune uh, reporter Jennifer Brooks interviewed them. So on day two, uh, the attempts to obtain gowns was, uh, was realized as impossible and uh, they decided to break into teams. They developed a design team, materials team, an FDA team, and a manufacturing team. On the third day, we asked the College of Design to join our efforts, 
and the search began for a manufacturer of gown material and a converter, a company that takes materials and produces gowns. And on day four, um, we started holding design meetings with M Health, uh, uh, Fairview uh, hospitals and clinics, physicians and nurses, so that we knew exactly what their needs were. And by day five, the design team had already completed preliminary drawings, uh, developed prototypes and photographs, as you can see here, to start showing converters and obtaining quotations. Fortunately for us, one of our design team is also an art student and uh, was very adept at um, assembling the prototypes, as you see, and even modeling them. So by April 27th, we were at our fifth revision of the gown design. Seemingly something so simple as a gown is actually very complex. It's uh, designed to fit all, one size fits all, and yet it has to be a significant barrier to infection. And as you know, waste material can come in, in a variety of forms, and these gowns need to go from the uh, level of protection of the face mask down to at least the knees. And you have to consider that some people have very large arms, some very thin arms, some people are thin, some are overweight. And so making this fit everyone was somewhat of a, a challenge. And, and hence the five revisions, and they're on their seventh revision now. Um, there are also significant elements to the design that were important, such as being able to use your finger to pull the sleeve into the gown. And you see a little hole here for that. That's been increased to two holes, one for the thumb and one for the pinky, so that the gown can be pulled into the glove and provide protection. And ties, of course, to bring around the waist and be able to be tied in front or back, depending on the size of the individual. And of course, a head hole as well. There were a lot of details as shown on the right-hand side of the display called out uh, that the manufacturers then had to entertain when giving us a quotation. So there'd be give and takes on certain elements of the design to make it manufacturable. And all these things were overcome very quickly, just within days. Um, between days six and 12, we held high level meetings with M Health Fairview. And we wanted to know exactly what the needs were, the physicians and the nurses and what the administrators were considering in terms of alternative sources, actual numbers of gowns that were needed, and what they exactly wanted from us. So we reviewed the criteria. We needed to consider the design, the availability of material, the cost, production capacity, and the reliability of delivery. So we found that using just one source of gowns as a, as a dependent um, would be not wise. So we ended up uh, identifying several potential converters. Uh, we did stick with one film uh, material manufacturer, uh, Polar Plastics, as uh, they were able to uh, produce on the spot for us our custom uh, material, a polyethylene film, uh, blue tinted and uh, anti-static and rolled specifically for our use uh, and being able to be easily used by the converter for manufacturing. And the, meth, and the material itself was FDA certified. So I just included a few photos here for you. You see uh, here at Polar Plastics, I went out and visited each of the presidents of the companies we interviewed. And um, here we see the facility itself. Producing this plastic film is quite a process. It, it is uh, blown into molds and, and then brought up uh, several levels for drying and folding, adding the color and so forth. And here we see some of that being done. Well, on uh, the day 13, uh, we set our specifications uh, for the materials and gown design at 2 M Health Fairview to begin the uh, purchase order process. And uh, on day 14, uh, material was manufactured at Polar Plastics and delivered overnight to Red Fox Innovations, the converter. And by May 1st, so a May Day gown, uh, the Red Fox Innovations began produ production of the gowns. So here are some pictures of the facility at Red Fox. We see some of the assemblers uh, working with patterns. They use large cutting machines that can make 
uh, 25 to 50 of these at one time, but to seam the or bond the sleeves uh, required doing this by hand. You can see on the far right hand side the uh, boxes of gowns as they are being produced, and uh, these required shipping by truck over to the Fairview systems. So the initial order was for 10,000 gowns, and uh, to date they produce now 30,000 gowns. Uh, and uh, they're continuing to produce these gowns for others as well, including nursing homes in our local community. Uh, within a day of the story appearing in the Star Tribune, there were over 40 inquiries to uh, Red Fox Innovations for manufacturing of gowns. So fortunately, we were able to provide an open access license and any, anyone, including countries, uh, others outside our own country um, are requesting gowns and or manufacturing them locally in their countries. So it was quite a successful effort. Uh, the team is continuing to refine the drawings based on feedback and uh, we're very happy it worked out this way. Thank you. That was terrific, Steve. Th thank you so much. Um, you know, having, having a project that has the Last slide, say finished on it is really quite uh, quite remarkable. They're both finished and having an impact. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker in this session is Aaron Tucker. Aaron is going with the Earl Bakken Medical Devices Center at the University of Minnesota, and Aaron's going to be sharing the absolutely remarkable story of the Coventer uh, ventilator system. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you very much. Give me one second. Are, are my slides up and running? They are. Okay. All right. So, um, is the original slide deck still up? I have my speaker notes just want to make sure I didn't mess that up. Uh, we're seeing it in speaker view, so we okay. need to. Okay. No problem. Okay, now we're, so good. Now we're good. good. Yeah, all right, thank you. So I will be telling you today about the uh, Coventer project, which we um, worked with uh, Dr. Stephen Richardson in anesthesiology uh, here in the Medical Devices Center to produce the Coventer, which was the first FDA approved emergency use ventilator alternative for COVID 19 patients. So, as many of you are aware, critical cases of COVID-19 require mechanical ventilation because of the severe lung damage that the virus causes. Um, and of course, as many people have already talked about today, the supply chains when it comes to uh, pandemic have been extremely thin and have been stretched to the breaking point. So um, early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of worry that we would need to provide additional ventilators for clinics and hospitals that would run out. Um, under the duress of the pandemic. So um, to kind of set the stage, there are really only two ventilation options right now. So there's uh, what you see on the left-hand side is an ICU ventilator. It's extremely well-designed, uh, very stringently tested. They've been proven to work. Uh, many people have, have been trained and, and have been uh, able to use these very successfully for COVID patients. However, these are also very complex and they take a long time to produce and a long time to manufacture due to the testing and the just sheer amount of components that go into these. So the only other option apart from these ICU ventilators is hand ventilation, which you see on the right hand side. And so this is used very, very commonly as a intermediate type of mechanical ventilation. So all it is is a healthcare provider squeezes and an Ambu bag, which is a very common brand that you see over there on the right hand side of the picture. Um, they squeeze this manual resuscitator bag to keep uh, a patient breathing, usually in, in terms of transport in between um, the hospital room and the operation room, or maybe in, in cases of trauma or CPR. So this is a very commonly used method of temporary ventilation. But should you run out of ICU ventilators, the only other option is hand ventilation, which you can imagine provides all kinds of problems in terms of exposure to the virus or other healthcare providers and just poor patient outcomes due to the fact that it's difficult to ventilate for hours on end. 
So um, Dr. Richardson, who is pictured on the far left-hand side of this picture, identified a need uh, for low-cost, readily available emergency ventilator alternatives in the event of the ventilator shortage. So Dr. Richardson uh, came to the Medical Devices Center in mid-March and presented us with this concept for emergency ventilation. Uh, and the idea that he had was using uh, these readily available AMBU bags and mechanical ventilation, uh, manual ventilation bags to uh, ventilate patients as a bridge in between ICU ventilators and just regular hand ventilation. <laughs> so we determined that the best way to go about this would be to use a very simple slider crank mechanism and readily available uh, manual resuscitator, resuscitator bags to provide a one-armed robot that would actually take the place of a healthcare provider who would have to manually ventilate and ventilate in a reliable and consistent manner. So the first prototype, which you see over here on the left, is what we call their version one. This is our MacGyver version. Uh, so all it is, is, as you can see, there's an exposed slider crank mechanism, a continually rotating motor, and an AMBU bag, which is being uh, compressed by the mechanism. So uh, the kind of the key to this entire project for us at the Medical Devices Center was testing every single new revision of our prototype in an efficient and effective manner. So the very first version of the prototype was tested on a simulator in the sim lab, um, but then within two days we had already moved on to a version two and our first successful animal test. So version two, which you see on the right hand side there, is the version which we use to test the mechanism aspects to ensure that the, uh, the component sizing and the uh, power was, was proper and provided the, the clinical results that we needed to see. Uh, so further testing uh, ensure, ensued as we continued to refine our design. So we performed a second animal test only two days after the first animal test. Uh, and finally, by version 3.1, we had moved away from the red toolbox which was a relief to us all, uh, into a much more manufacturable version of this slider crank uh, manual resuscitator bag compressor design, which you see here. So version 3.1, we also performed an animal test on, and uh, I, I should mention that we performed four in total, and all four of them were, were successful, all of the animals survived, all of them had uh, acceptable clinical outcomes. So um, I also have to thank the university because they were incredible in giving us access to the animals and giving us access to the ability to test our design in, a, in this highly effective manner. So after, uh, after we completed our third animal test, we began to think about how we were going to scale this. So version 3.2 came along, and this is when we started to dip into the local Minnesota community for help. So uh, we, our, the aim of our design was to create something that was so simple that it would be easily manufacturable by a whole number of people all over the world if need be. So what we did was we put out a call for help in the local Minnesota community. We asked for components for 25 prototypes. We had over 300 responses from local companies within, I think it was four or five days, uh, all willing to help and all willing to pitch in a couple of components here or there. So. <clears throat> In addition to that, we were also able to reach into our student intern network and with the proper safety procedures and approval from uh, the medical school, we were able to put together a team of students to assemble 25 prototypes of version 3.2 in order to test the manufacturability and to test the final components. Uh, so the picture that you see here is a group of those student volunteers working in the brainstorming room of the early Bakken Medical Devices Center. Uh, from there, we knew that we needed to move this outside of the university in order to ramp up. So using our, our industry connections, which we've built over many years here at the center, uh, we quickly formed a collaborative team between Boston Scientific, Medtronic, and United Health Group. Um, United Health Group were, were provided the money, and they actually purchased the first 3,000 co-vendors, is, is what we ended up calling this. Uh, and Boston Scientific provided manufacturing, and Medtronic provided additional expertise along the way. So here you see our first socially distant meeting between uh, members of management of the uh, three companies that formed our, our big collaboration. Uh, so then, uh, 
only two weeks after the project introduction, we were able to submit for emergency use authorization to the FDA. So the version that you see here is version 3.2. This was um, the version that made it into the emergency use authorization. And we worked very closely with university attorneys as well as with Boston Scientific in order to submit all of the data and the designs and the uh, indications as well as the safety features of this ventilator. Uh, so then 30 days, only 30 days after we had received the original need from Dr. Richardson, we got the Coventer approved by the FDA for emergency use in the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as you see here, the design is essentially the same as it was actually in the red toolbox, believe it or not. Uh, it's a very simple slider crank mechanism with an adjustable respiratory rate and a fixed tidal volume. And it's compatible with a wide range of different brands of manual resuscitator bags. And uh, what it does is it provides this one-armed robot platform where you can take the place of a health professional who would have to hand ventilate a patient in the event that you run out of a high-end ICU ventilator. Um, so just to be clear, this isn't replacing a, an ICU ventilator, this is a bridge in case you run out, and in case the supply chain hasn't caught up and you aren't able to uh, actually put enough ventilators into clinics for patients to need them. So perhaps the, the most Studying part of this project to me was the timeline. So the exactly 67 days, so just over two months from the project introduction to the point where United Health Group had finished 3,000 co-vendors. Um, so as you can see, we had our project introduction, our first and second and uh, third and fourth animal studies happened with all within two weeks. Um, and then you were able to hand off the project to Boston Scientific as well as act as uh, engineering advisors throughout their production. Uh, we got our FDA emergency use approval after 30 days. And then after another 30-ish days, we got uh, 3,000 co-ventors completed. So as far as I know, no device has received emergency use authorization after only 30 days. And we were also the first emergency use ventilator to be approved by the FDA. Uh, there were many, many other concepts throughout the country, many universities and, and companies produced different ideas, um, but I'm really quite humbled that we ended up being in the best position to, to get approval and we were able to pave the way uh, for the rest of these concepts as well. So I have to thank our uh, multidisciplinary team, of course, that was, was put together here at the university. Um, as, as you've seen from these other presentations, it's really, really important to have clinicians working hand in hand with engineers as you go through these projects. So uh, Dr. Richardson was with us every step of the way, making sure that we were achieving our clinical outcomes, making sure that we hadn't uh, compromised any portion of the design from a clinical perspective. And then of course, we also worked with um, uh, a fellow from the center to, to provide clinical support as well as the other uh, engineers and, and, and of course, Dr. Irving in our center as well. So finally, I want to uh, announce that our design files have been released online. We've already gotten downloads from over 25 countries. I've uh, personally spoken and helped uh, engineers from Peru and from South Africa and from India uh, in, in their own versions of Coventers. And um, these licenses are, or these files are available through a free license uh, through the University Technology and Commercialization Office. Uh, so with that, I want to thank all of our collaborators, I can't possibly thank every company individually, it would take entirely too long, but these are many of the companies that helped us really get this concept over the line. So, uh, thank you for your time and I'll gladly take any questions. Thank you, Aaron. That's a really, you know, remarkable and uh, terrific story and particularly the, the number of the devices that have been built and the interest from entities all around the world in what uh, you and your team have done uh, at the University of Minnesota. So we do just have a couple minutes left for questions. If anyone has questions, so they can uh, type them into the, the box uh, while we're waiting. I just have uh, one question for Steve Sliderman. Steve, if you could just, um, you talked a little bit about the students, but uh, may, maybe you could just 
describe who these students are and what you think the, their takeaways were from being engaged in the GOWN project. Yes, can you hear me okay well? Yes. Um, so this was quite an opportunity for the students. They have um, certainly experienced a, a disappointment with closing of the school due to the COVID-19 in terms of having hands-on lab experience. And we did get through at least the first half of the semester. But I think there was, uh, there was something that was missing. And I think those of us who are teaching all know what I'm referring to. And when this project came along, um, it, it not only was a noble effort, but the students just jumped on it because it was something to do, something valuable, something they would learn from. And the emails I've received from the students over the past two weeks are just fantastic. Um, they, they point to this as being one of the best learning experiences they've ever had, and that it'll be an experience they'll remember the rest of their lives. And I'm sure they will. And I'm sure these students, these 17 students who went through the trials and tribulations, and I'm telling you there were a lot of up and down days during those two weeks, these students will be our leaders next time there's a, a call for immediate assistance. The next crisis, these will be the students who will be the leaders. That's great, thank you, Steve. Uh, Aaron, we have one question for you. Uh, what concerns do physicians have about the range of pressure and volume flow for very sick patients? Yeah, so uh, for very sick patients, what we anticipate is that ICU ventilators will still be used in, in cases where you have really poor lung compliance or in cases uh, maybe if, if, if there's a, a very old person who has very stiff lungs, the co-venter might not be uh, the ideal solution for them. But the idea is, is that somebody who is able to go on the co-venter can free up the ICU ventilator for uh, somebody else who may need it for their more specific clinical uh, concerns. That was great. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, we've reached the end of our time. I want to thank everyone uh, for attending and listening to our six fantastic speakers. I want to thank John and Lindsay and Asan and Chris and Steve and Aaron for six very compelling stories. I do invite you to join us in the continuing Design and Medical Devices conference series, which will be Tuesdays at 9 a.m. for the remainder of this month. So we'll see you back here. Uh, on Tuesday, and you can check the Design and Medical Devices uh, conference uh, schedule for an update of the topics. Uh, what, one last question, are PowerPoints available at the DMD website? Uh, we'll, we'll check on that. These um, sessions are being recorded, and we'll check about the, um, uh, the PowerPoints, but you're free to uh, connect with any one of the speakers about their slide decks. Uh, you can contact me or just uh, contact the um, DMD uh, email line. So for that, um, thank you and uh, have a good day, everyone.